called the Needle Defender Landing Range, which I'm pretty sure most of you do not know, but it's fine. At the time, it was important because there was nobody else making games in the country. And um, so I stayed there for six years, I think. And then I went to Boom Zap, and I was, a, I was a writer for Anino, and then I was a designer for Boom Zap, eventually producer. And for Boom Zap, um, most of my job was making casual adventure franchises, so like Awakening, Dana Nightstone, my hidden object adventure games on the PC. And um, then after that, um, that's a different story altogether. Maybe later. Okay, um, back in 2002, when I was still in college, I already wanted to make games, but I didn't know there was a company here that makes them. So I thought maybe I'll just go abroad and uh, work, uh, find a game that job. But then before I graduated, somebody texted me, Hi, I'm Yael from Anima Entertainment. Uh, come here to our office to apply for a, for a game programmer position. And I thought, hmm, I need an entertainment. It sounds like a nightclub. So I was not going to do that. And it turns out to be our company. So I got accepted. Then after that, I transferred to different companies. Some of them, uh, uh, some of these companies are GameDog, Boomdog, and now I'm here in yeah, uh, I've always known that uh, I wanted to make games here ever since uh, I got my Commodore D20. Uh, I, I was taking MIS in college in the I really knew I wanted to make games, but there was no big company to speak of in, uh, in the Philippines then. So when I graduated in 2000, I worked in IT. I was a web programmer uh, doing PHP and Pro development for this website called IT7.net, which is the website of Inquirer and Jimmy 7. And then while I was doing the work, of course, I'd always browser side, uh, I saw an article on our website about the first uh, Filipino-made game yeah, being made. So this was uh, Anito, and it's being made by my Anito Entertainment. So the first thing I did was I Googled the website, or Altavista, the website, I'm not sure which one. Uh, it sent them an email, and then I got an invitation to, uh, to interview with them on a Saturday. So I go there on a Saturday morning, there's still two people that uh, just woke up or still kind of asleep on the couch. It, the, the small office vaguely smells of overnight. Uh, yeah, and then I was interviewed asked to write an essay about why I wanted to make games. And then yeah, I got in as a, as a game designer. And I've been making games ever since. So I, I too interviewed at the New York. And I failed. <laughs> <laughs> Your essay wasn't good enough. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Um, so, talk about a little bit um, the games that, that you guys made before like before there was a marketplace, before, um, I guess before people were even aware that there was a, a, a game center. Like, uh, you know, yeah, at least I know. It was after my time. I mean, it was before my time, but um, they definitely had some like, award-winning games. Uh, that they made. So could you could you walk us through like some of those games? Um, so some EPLD stuff. Uh, so that's one of the companies during that time that uh, was making games. So from the media. Um, and we were an army for uh, we were an army of EPLD. Uh, the the stuff that we made for for the the games that we made. During that time, we're for Nokia and Sony Ericsson. And Sony Ericsson. Um, um, and uh, some stuff won awards, but I wasn't there yet. Third half, yeah. Third half. Uh, Anito, third half was, was a tie up with uh, Anito property that Anino made. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> um, um, and uh, there was this game that we made uh, that won awards in Saudi Asia. It was called Gearbox Puzzle Party. It was for, yeah, for Sony Ericsson. But uh, during that time, I don't know if anybody was ever able to download it because there was no kind of app store to speak of. Do they still exist? Jeff probably has some, uh, somewhere. 
But yeah, um, so there were some awards that we won recently, but the market was not mature yet at that time. No app stores existed. So yeah. So um, the three of us actually worked on the Anita Defend a Landed Ring. And uh, for those who haven't seen it, um, it's like Diablo 2 but set in the Philippines. And the story is uh, your uh, brother and sister, um, anak ng Datu, basically, and your father goes missing. And there were two playable storylines. So you could play as the, the sister or the brother. And you were being invaded by, um, well, not invaded, but basically you were occupied by. The, the Spanish type rulers, and so it's a lot of um, local um, magic, local mythology that we use. Um, there was a tikbalang, that's one of your first boss fights, etc. Um, a lot of local weapons as well, and um, that was really interesting to make for us. And um, it actually got nominated in the IGF in San Francisco, so on GDC, um, and it won best in audio because it was a lot of Filipino tribal music. Um, and then, so all three of us worked on that. And then for Boom Zap, which also three of us worked on, uh, for me, I was working on the uh, aforementioned philology game. So, for example, the Awakening series, um, it I think it sold over... It's, over 10 million downloads. There are over 10 million downloads of it. Um, it was on PC and then we ported it to iOS as well. And... Um, those games, the man, on the PC, the, the market's very different because we made it for a publisher called Big Fish Games. And so Big Fish Games had its own platform, basically. You, you would download the launcher, and then you would open it, and then you could download games inside. Kind of like Steam, but only Big Fish Games inside. And they had a subscriber base. So that means that you had to, to pay to get access to any of the games that they had, as well as buying the game itself. And so it was an ecosystem within Big Fish, but there were so many users, paying users. And so they would pay for our game and you know, play it for four hours. You would spend months and months developing it, and after four hours, they finished the whole thing. And they're like, it's so short, you know, we want more. And, and so every day they would release a new game every day. That's the market of Big Fish. It's completely different. Um, and then I think now they're more focused on mobile. It's a completely different market as well. What? Game it Flipside, no? Yeah. You guys. <laughs> they, they made a lot of games. Yeah. Uh, so I've been on Outsource in 2004. This was 2005 to 2009. Uh, it was called Flipside Games. And uh, we did a lot, lots of different types of work. Uh, two really stand out in my memory. So the first one was that we were making like really shitty Flash games for this Indian portal called Games to Game. Uh, it wasn't shitty because like we were trying to make shitty games. It was shitty because we we had like one month, one thousand dollar budget to make a game every single month. And even in two thousand, even in two thousand six, two thousand seven, that, that wasn't a lot to go on. And being a small, so we were like ten to twelve man company, trying to make ends meet. We tried our best to like to do the best jobs that we could, but uh, like given what we were faced and the economics of it at the time. Like, you, you really had to make some compromises and cut some corners. And so that taught us a lot about like what what you don't want to compromise on. Uh, I guess the proudest thing that I worked on while I was at the time was making uh, making some artwork for a company called Boomza. So that's what that's how I got into Boomza in the first place. Uh, we were making some of the assets for some of their early puzzle titles. And we were very good friends with the founders. So when we decided, uh, I decided to shut down Flipside. Had a really long talk with, with the founders and uh, essentially shut down the studio on a Friday and then started working for them the next Monday. So that, that's an excellent segue. Um, very good friends with the founders in Bunga. So when did you decide to turn your backs on Bunga <laughs> and uh, form how would you betray the trust? <laughs> 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 On the record, I, I was never involved with Boomstuff. <laughs> so I don't know. So every, there is a record of this. 
Everyone thinks, I know, it's my fault. Yeah, I'm forgetting everyone together. But it's actually you, Ms. Oh my god. Yeah. So, there was one evening, uh, John, Luna and I were drinking. Yeah, so we've been friends for a long while. This is our the second company that we work together. And essentially, Luna said, Gabby, I'm very unhappy. I want to quit my job and become a barista. Or a yes. yeah. so, she, so she got burned out, essentially. And we won't go into why she got burned out. She got burned out. And yeah, she was ready to quit things then. And I'm all like being, I guess, an opportunist that I am. I said, wait, 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 wait. Before you apply at Starbucks, let me talk to a few people. So the very next morning, I Skyped with Mark. And Mark knew it was a very uh, important Skype. Because usually when we Skype for work, no video. Because you don't really want to video Skype with people you work with, especially when everyone works from home. This time, video came in. Nasaan do si Mark? Nakakong bahay din ako. I still remember those things. And then, right, Mark, I think uh, it's time to start our own company. Sabi niya, okay, sige, sali ako. And then, uh, so okay, secured three or uh, no, what I thought was four people that I wanted to get. So next up was uh, no, Paul Gatti, the ever elusive uh, partner who is not very well. So yeah, Paul is very elusive and he was working for a uh, tech company at that time because he had a mobile game or a Facebook game company before that that had failed. So I tried to really uh, convince him that uh, um, we're in, the three of us are in, uh, you look for some investors, and he was, ah, uh, sige, me, medyo, baka, baka lang. I'm very unsure. And then, while we were in that meeting, our investor, Sinix Nuredon, uh, walks in and tells us, like, uh, his vision of what attitude could be. So, from there, he was in. Okay, so there were four of us already. And we didn't have an art director. Um, we've known Chester for a long time, but we didn't think he'd be interested because he was very successfully freelancing for a long time then. So, so we said, okay, here we are, four co-founders. We need to find an art director, but that probably doesn't matter for co-founders at this. And then we talked to Chester. <laughs> okay, and then Chester said, okay, so again, yeah, I'm in, but I want to be in as a full partner like all of you. And when Chester Ocampo says that, you just say yes. And that's how, that's how Altitude was born. I'd like to dwell on Chester. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I, like, I guess like for the three of them, it was a little bit more natural. But uh, the last time that we've had like these kinds of conversations, you, you never, it never came up about you will want to do start your, your own company or like you seem very happy. I mean, you, you can talk a little bit about like some of the high growth work you've done, but like you seem very happy and comfortable being a freelance artist that work on like stuff for EA or in other properties. So so for you, uh, personally for you, Chester Ocampo. El Pinoy. Oh yeah. Uh, no, what what made you what made you make that leap, I guess? Okay, so as you said, I, I had a very comfortable run freelancing and uh, I guess the answer is age. <laughs> um, I was at that point where I was thinking how sustainable a freelancing career was for a guy in his 30s. And I'm like, I don't know. 30 something. Let's not dwell on the other digit. Um, and uh, what made me make that leap was I was thinking. Uh, the freelancing was steady, it was good. Uh, but yeah, like the day to day worry about getting clients, and you never know when you're gonna get a dry spell. So that's that's a huge factor, especially if you're like trying to set things up in your life. Yeah, about a auto life view. Actually, got that idea from you. Uh, how to add those. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and I kind of blame you um, a little bit. Um, so yeah, so I made that leap uh, from comfortable freelancing jobs to stressful art director life. 
And it's, uh, I would say, I'm still not sure if it's worth it. <laughs> it's so fucking hard. Um, no, no, it is. Like, uh, it's very rewarding every now and then, but the amount of stress that I'm getting, I thought it was, uh, I thought freelancing was stressful. Boy, oh boy. It's different, it's different. Try to run a company. It's different. Like secretly breaking up uh, the uh, I like being a moderator because I get I get to ask like particular questions. I won't ask you a question. Uh, so I, I'm not sure. Like a few, I'm not sure it was like a year ago or so, where um, when when Altitude first came out, or announced you know, like they were forming a company, and then they announced like they got investment, um, like. $250,000 or whatever? Yeah. And then there was this guy, it was his blog, um, that wrote about that. He said, $250,000 and they're making this, this, this weird little big core game. Like if I had that $250,000, I'd do this, that, and the other thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what I wanted to actually, I mean, I, I, I'm raising this question because actually I, I, I want to, like, address like some of the misinformation about like how much money uh, it actually takes to to make a game. Uh, so like if I, I mean I guess this is more focused on, on that being on it or, or you know, if the other guys have input on this like what's why, well, where does that money go? I know that like uh, I, I know that the company is expanding and uh, there are obviously different aspects of it that you know, that need to you know that need paying for. Um, so can you just give us a basic idea of like where yeah, where I guess where where does all that money go? Well, my pocket, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, when it comes to budgeting, I think you see this a lot in uh, in Kickstarter games that have either completely failed or gone beyond budget. And the biggest misconception among zero like small indie like. Here's how much in the uh, here's how much expense I have to live in a month. So let's multiply that for my three because there are three of us, and then let's have times twelve because it will take us twelve months to make the game, and let's raise exactly that much money. Now, if you have done that or if you're doing that, I can tell you there's probably like sixty to eighty percent chance that you will run out of money before finishing your game, and. Uh, and what pe most people don't realize is that uh, when you are actually running a business that, uh, that aims to scale, a lot of things go past in just like how much money do you need uh, so that you, you, know, you can comfortably live and still make games full time. So for example, when we started a company, uh, just getting started and being incorporated in Singapore for several reasons, one of those was that you, see, you couldn't actually sell enough purchases from Google Play from the Philippines then. And because we were a company that was designed to get investment from the start, people wanted to invest in a Singapore company instead of a Philippine company. So, yun palang, it actually incurred like, uh, a significant cost just to get up and running. Uh, we actually got a very small office, which was a room from another startup called Calibre in Makati. And yeah, that was actually low, but apart from the salary, so we of course, we did everything legit in terms of uh, getting all of the licenses, uh, uh, getting the permits, and then it comes to hiring people. And we actually, for example, offered health care to our employees very early on. So these are things that you don't usually think about when uh, when you're a small indie studio that's just uh, trying to you know keep keep your basic costs when making game. So when you're uh, when you want to or a company that's designed to scale, there will be a lot of other things you need to budget for. And when you are asking for money, you have to make sure to keep those in mind because the amount of time or money it takes, you think it takes to make your game is usually wrong. And you know, I've never seen a game that was really like finished early and then did, did a lot better than people think if, uh, it would. Yeah, so 
It's very making game, like between three people, it's very different making game just, just with the one person. Um, uh, yeah, so hopefully you guys have a better idea now of how much it actually costs uh, to make a game. Uh, let's, I'm interested in going back a little bit and uh, since the group were supposed to be the old people, do you guys remember, do you guys remember anyone from before uh, us that maybe just you know, hobby games or any, any companies that you have ever heard of? Yeah. Uh, so the only guy I know really that is as ancient as we are in game developers is, uh, is Eric Dreadlass. And I'll tell you uh, how we got to know him. Uh, so, so we finished Anito, and yon, we and then uh, we couldn't make another game of that ma magnitude after that. So we tried to go into fun pile of games, handheld games. Actually, Mark was part of that team. I think Luna was the part-time accountant of Anito at that time. Uh, because there was no there was no writing job to be had. And the only other Pinoy that we knew making games was this company called Aesop Interactive, which was Eric and I believe his partner at the time, who were uploading games to the Handang on a platform for, for Pan Pilots. So yeah, so if you you know, Pan Pilots Handang go is so like two thousand four, two thousand five stuff. And yeah, and it took me actually like several years before I could meet him in person. It was probably not until 2008, 9 that I got to meet him. So we shared, like we saw a lot of stories from the good old days back then. Okay, so back to Altitude. Um, so obviously you're like, you know, the Kubernetes all-star team of, of developers. Uh, can you guys, each of you, uh, go over like some of your specific responsibilities and maybe like um, was there stuff that you learned from your previous jobs that actually carried over, and like, well, what's the new stuff that you have learned um, for, for, for your start? <laughs> okay. Um, stuff I have to learn. Unity. Yeah, everything. Absolutely. Um, Unity. So. Just a bit of a background, I've been freelancing like six years on illustrations, not games. Like, uh, they're game related, but mostly like marketing, promotion, promotional assets or uh, concept art. Um, some in-game assets, but I never integrated them into the community. Uh, as to when we, when, we, when we started the Dalta group, uh, our first game only had me as the artist, so I had to do like all of the graphic stuff. So I had to learn everything from scratch with Unity and uh, work out like what, what animations I can do uh, with that. And I haven't even touched animations ever since pixel art, the pixel art stuff that I did like 10 years prior. So I had to relearn a lot of stuff real fast for uh, uh, to get the game up and running because we had to uh, show show that game to like a convention and at that time, um, and um, six years of freelancing, I wasn't handling anyone, just myself. Uh, but now that I'm an art director again, I have to learn how to handle people and not hate them. <laughs> um, for me, uh, are there any game designers here, by the way? Um, so for me, uh, I was a game designer at Boomzap, and the design philosophy of Boomzap is very similar to the one in Altitude. Basically, the game designer scripts his or her own stuff. So it's not um, it's not the programmer hard coding anything. The programmer makes the tools so that the designer can do whatever he or she wants with it. And um, I have never touched Unity also, uh, so I I learned that here. Um, but uh, things like level design, scripting, and we had we, our first game, Run Run Super 5. Um, I had never made a runner, so that was new. I had studied a lot of runners. And uh, just building the levels, that was um, the, the similar, also the process that we do is uh, there's a lot of prototyping. So I got to make, um, you know, levels early on and kind of prototype, you know, what the jump height should be, what the jump arc should be, things like that, um, run speed. And, um, what else did we learn from other jobs? Um, 
my game writing experience has proven handy, even though, for example, mobile games, the ones that you make don't have a lot of text in them, unlike the, the PC games that we were making before. Uh, it's still So that's when the company started. Um, we, were, we were already running. We already have a playable prototype, and I can make systems for the, the designer and the artist. Um, the things I learned that I retained from from Boomzap are um, how to make the game data driven processes like daily builds, um, source control, uh, things like that. Um, Things I have to learn are to manage people as well. Um, I have to train myself not to be too OC of other people's code. Um, <laughs> because I, I tend to want to change everything. <laughs> okay, so my job in the company, I guess I'm not the guy who makes games. I'm the guy who, who views the company as a startup or uh, my job is the guy who makes sure that we have a company that makes very, very good things. And the reason that I want, I reached out to my co-founders in the first place is that I could not do, with, do this without the very best people in the field. So I knew, I always knew I wanted to start a company with these people. Uh, apart from that, uh, I was the one who got uh, initial funding uh, for, for the company. And uh, the fundraising in the company is, uh, I, I have the sole yeah, so that's that's my role, and it's one of the roles that only I can do. Uh, apart from that, uh, scaling the yeah, so that's that's my role, and it's one of the roles that only I can do. Uh, apart from that, uh, scaling the company, hiring people, all of the hires also go through me, making sure the culture is very good. So we have a very specific culture, uh, wherein uh, I guess you would say most of the people uh, in our company are. Mm, uh, mid-level to senior because we retain the element of Boondop where we work 100% remote. So at Boondop we have no office and everyone just work from home or wherever through chat. In this company we changed a bit where uh, we have a small office in Makati where uh, if people want to meet, they can meet there. But most of the time, people are still working remotely and all of the systems are online. -based. So this means that uh, there is a lot less face-to-face -face, uh, than you would have in any traditional company. So it means that uh, a lot of people that come into into Altitude already have uh, at least a good working knowledge of what it takes to be a game developer, and then we just teach them the specific tools. Uh, I guess one of the hardest things that we we are learning, continuing to learn right now, is how to do proper free-to-play. But there's a lot of misconceptions about free-to-play, especially coming in and you don't appreciate how hard it is until you actually try it. Do you remember him? Yeah. yeah. So the rabbit hole is very deep and you can spend a lot and lot and lot of money, like millions of pesos, for, and then release it and then for no one to play it. Or people to play it, but they will never buy anything. So it's very, uh, I guess, systems design heavy. Uh, it's very analytics heavy. In fact, we have a full-time data analyst in our team. Uh, and it also requires a lot of uh, ongoing operations once a, game, once a game is done. In fact, we have our own publishing team that's made up of X level up games uh, people because they were used to publishing MMO, free to play MMO games in the Philippines, and now they are publishing our own mobile games around the world. What was it like making and then? Now, um, well, for us, I guess Gabby yeah, can talk about the, the business decision as to why we made the the and match three. Uh, for me, as a game designer, I had never made a match three, so we had to make the engine. I had to learn again. I had to play a ton of match threes. And um, 
it was fun for me because now I uh, I get to learn a new genre. I get to balance a new genre, and um, for our team as well because the the mastery game had a customizable doll, meaning that you could use your money to buy stuff for your dress up doll, and um, we had never done that before either. And actually now we have a working mastery engine and a working dress up doll customizable you know engine. So it's like great. So. <laughs> okay. uh, so on our end, uh, so we're uh, we're making what you could say is a, like very risky in terms of we're making new IP and free to play, which requires a lot of uh, upfront investment. And uh, because of that, we we got uh, an investor in from Surface to to de-risk the company a bit. And uh, this game was the opportunity to us to do something. That, uh, that was more secure in terms of revenue, so that we can continue risking in terms of the original games that we're doing. Um, if you see a lot of companies that are doing very risky, innovative stuff, you you can see that there is some sort of system on their end that's sort of a fail-safe, so that uh, one one failed risky game does not run them out of business. For example, as Pixar talks about, for every one new franchise that they make, they actually make to two sequels. So that's their form of de-risking their business model where even for a company as as large and as powerful, as creative as Pixar, they still have to mitigate the risk. So uh, of course we, we like kind of trying pushing the envelope to what we can do, but we don't want to do it in such a way wherein if we fail, then we're gone as a company because it's, it's not only ourselves. Uh, first of all, our employees, our investors, our families, we also have to keep that in mind. And uh, we're a little, I guess, different in the form of, like a lot of the team are in their like, mid to late 30s, they're two guys 40. So we're a more family, I guess, oriented team, or company than, than a lot of other studios. So we can't spend 12 to 14 hours anymore, uh, like you know, working, just, uh, you know, we get sleepy. And then, and then we go to sleep, and then our kids wake us up in the morning. So. We try to keep that balance also between like uh, trying to do uh, good innovative work that can make money but super risky but you know, more uh, uh, games with more more sure revenue potential. Okay, so we're about to wrap up. Um, just one last question for you guys. Now looking, I guess, towards the future, uh, where like where do you see Altitude? Um, you know, like in five years, or where are you, like each of you, maybe personally, like what are your, what are your hopes and aspirations uh, for uh, for your studio? Uh, well, business-wise, I'm I'm hoping that we'd have a lot of games published already, um, and we cement our status as a both a developer and a publisher. That's for the company. Um, for like personally, um, I'm hoping to like as devices uh, become more powerful over time. I'm I'm hoping to be able to integrate a lot of effects and uh, basically just visual stuff that are currently limited on phones. Like you think uh, phones these days are powerful enough run all the stuff that you see on your like PC or your phone, so no, they're not. Um, so there's still a bit of like I'm still waiting for that to happen for devices, so that we can so that the stuff looks really good. Um, for me, I want this to be the last job I will ever have. Which is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't I don't want this to fold. I want to be. I want to be here with Altitude as the creative director for as long as humanly possible. And um, I want us to succeed. I think everybody here in the mind wants us to succeed. I want us to succeed. For me personally, and this is six, I don't know if it's silly, but um, in Boom's app, I would meet people randomly and then they would say, oh, I totally played you know, your game, it was great. But I have this little childish. Um, dream that I'm going to see somebody playing my game on the street, like, you know, playing in the, whatever, MRT or in line, like they're playing a game that I've made. So that's never happened to me. And um, 
that's what we're trying to do is we want to make a game that is just like uh, ev yeah like it doesn't have to be a huge financial success maybe <laughs> um, I don't want that <laughs> but uh, I want to make an IP that everybody knows and loves and um, we're still hoping for that for every game that we make uh, for me personally, uh, I I hope Abichu will, will be will become bigger than Supercell. Wow! <laughs> so that's my personal uh, wish. No one gets Toei and someone. So yeah, you have to dream big, man. Um, I also want to to introduce myself as oh, I made this game and everybody knows. What that game is. <laughs> yeah. So Lulu kind of beat me to it, no? And um, she said she wanted it to be her last job. So uh, I see myself running this company for probably like the next 20 years or until they pick me up. Uh, let me expand a bit ano, on Mark, what Mark said about ano, about Supercell. So we, we really greatly admire Supercell. And, it, and it's not because they make $5 million. Of course, who doesn't want that? But you have to go back to what makes them so successful. And when you look at their secret to success, it's a lot of highly skilled and highly motivated small teams of developers working with each other, experimenting a lot, experimenting and actually failing a lot, and making sure that they find, they find the games that they are really proud of and want to bring to the rest of the world. They talk about games that people want to play for years, if not decades. Uh, so for example, if you haven't noticed recently, the si Clash of Clans has got full masa now. Uh, like every person in the street is actually playing it. And that's, that's not by accident. Uh, the game is a lot deeper now than when it started three years ago. So it was, uh, it was already a, a top grossing hit then. And now it's even gone deeper and permeated itself in for example, uh, for me, in the Masa era in, uh, in the Philippines, uh, so it started with Ragnarok, which was dominant for a long time. And then for a while, yeah, it was actually Farmville. And you can, you can make the case for like which, which MOBA is most popular here. And then now, I think in terms of accessibility, it's actually Clash of Clans. So, you know, so uh, around your lining up the department store, the, a cashier between, you know, between taking customers actually protecting their base, and so, you know, it's it's crazy in how mass market itself uh, it has been, and uh, they they haven't really quote unquote dumbed down their game, but they they made it super accessible and made it very social, so that people can play the game and enjoy it with their friends, with their families for a long time, and that's what we want. Okay, thank you very much, Altitude Games. Everyone, let's give them a round of applause. And we're opening up the floor for questions. Okay, so this question is aimed at Luna. You okay. You've been more experienced uh, in the in the uh, in narrative since I'm also aiming. To have a position in the industry as a uh, game uh, narrative of uh, designer and writer. Uh, so, but are you aware of visual novels? And uh, uh, and uh, if you are aware, uh, how can uh, aware or not? Uh, how would you advise to uh, an aspirant? Like me. Okay, so the question was, um, how, what do I know about visual novels, and how can I give you advice on how to succeed, basically, in yeah. making your. Okay, so um, I am aware, and um, I unfortunately I'm not very familiar with the market. So um, what what I learned at Altitude is game making is really a business. So you can make the game that you want to make, and just release it, and just see how it goes, right? But um, the way we do it is we would research um, which platform will it succeed on, uh, what are the trends, what do people like and don't like, for example, about 
could be about the, the gameplay or how you know how it how it plays through, or it could be about story as well. Um, I don't know how how artistic you want to be with your narrative, so you can really go both ways. You can tell the story you've always wanted to tell, um, or you could also look at what are the stories that are being told now, or what are the stories that no one's telling that I feel like I should be the first one to tell. What story is important now? Um, and then you put that into a market where you know it has the best chance of succeeding. Uh, it also depends on how reliant you are on this game for your life. Like, is this the only source of income you want? In which case, if you uh, maybe do a beta test or an alpha test and have people play, and then they say, you know, I really like this character, but I, I wish she didn't die, for example. I don't know. Um, as a writer, it's very hard to take criticism about story. Because it's like, well, I wanted to kill her. You know, it's my story, not yours. Um, but if you want this to be, for example, if it's a paid app, right, or not, it, it's hard to, to decide what kind of story you want to do. Um, I would advise you, just because I'm coming from a more business side, is to do a little bit of research. You don't have to go and just tell, you know, well, vampire stories were really in, so I'm going to do a vampire story. It's not like that. Uh, yeah, it, um, but if you know that um, in this market, for example, no one's telling the story, and I love this story, and I've let people play it, I've let people read it, and they love this story too, I must be on to something. So just just do to see what's out there, maybe. Um, but if you don't want to do that, and you just want to like tell your story regardless of what people think, then then. Good for you. It, 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 I don't know how much uh, you're relying on this as a career. Did uh, it make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, since I'm a solo developer, uh, I well, since I'm a solo developer, uh, I pretty much uh, swing both ways. Uh, I know that uh, I am uh, I envision uh, uh, the stuff I want to write. But I also take to heart uh, what what, uh, what people want uh, because uh, of course in uh, in a visual novel market, which I'm also uh, more aware of than uh, you, to be honest. Uh, there are okay. Currently, uh, since the visual novel market and the anime market are closely that especially in Japan. Uh, the current uh, hot thing are idols, as uh, for example, Love Live. Uh, Love Live, by the way, also has an app. Yeah. Uh, whatever is hot at the moment, yeah, developers fight, especially the uh, saggy vision of the market. Uh, Alright, um. Well, maybe you can take that off. We have the room now later on uh, during the day. But is there uh, anyone else has a question? Kevin again? Come on. Come on, Mike. Let's get this guy a chance. Yeah, sure. Okay. Then I'm trying to create many games. Many games that I should do. I, when in life do you take care of the game? Sorry, could you do it when making any games? I'm trying to create many games. When and where I should do Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so just wait, 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 um, so yeah, it, it, it's it's different. It's a it's a it's a case to case basis. Um, but yeah, but that's what happened for me. Uh, Gabby didn't go into detail about um, like when you know, he decided to. Yeah, so you can think of these two ways, either um, as indie or as a studio or startup. Uh, my advice for indie is that at the last possible moment. So, Brian Newman wasn't that late. It was just a little late in in. Uh, in registering because he was already going to meet with a person there who was going to be the money in the back. And of course, definitely, if you have a publisher, they deal with companies, not with individuals. So if you plan to deal with publishers, go ahead, uh, incorporate. 
uh, if you are a small one, two, three man team uploading stuff on Steam or the App Store yourself, uh, I don't think you need to have a company to receive revenue from, from these App Stores. And putting up a company uh, requires an amount of overhead in terms of in accounting, reporting, PR, tax permits, all, all of that fun stuff. Uh, you know, that takes you away from actually making games. So as an indie team, you probably don't want to do that until you know you're very close to having to deal with it. Something also about publishing. Uh, usually, uh, you know, publishing deals will take like weeks or months to before, or even a year, like before it actually comes to fruition. So I actually thought I had more time to, to do this, and then like within days, the publisher said, "Yes, I'm funding you," and I said. Holy shit, are you crazy? And then you're saying no. Uh there are other questions? Hello. Um the question is how do you start a game design career? How do you how do you find work in the industry that is um, very much just game design? Because I I I was once a game developer. Uh, for a company in Makati, and then I shifted to a career in the academy. I am now currently a full-time instructor in Manila. And because of the upcoming um, problems with regarding to teaching load because of the K-12 implementation here in the Philippines, uh, I am currently planning to uh, going back to the industry. However, I do not want to go back to programming. As a, as a career in the game industry. That is why I am, uh, I would like to practice uh, game design. So, how do I find work um, with it in the industry that is just game design? <laughs> The first thing you have to do is to make a portfolio. Uh, it really helps when you apply to say these are the games I've done, even if they're just a you know tiny game that was never published. Even if it's like uh, we we discourage it, but even if it's like a design doc, we just to see that we we can see that you know what you're talking about, right? You've, you've given it some thought. Um, if you can't do that yourself, but you're a coder, so you probably can. But if you couldn't, you could. Uh, ask someone to help you or even just make something in Minecraft or, or something or buy assets in Unity store just make something um, submit it to as many companies as you can that's it it's just like any other job uh, it, it always helps if you know someone just like any other job but really what will make your resume stand out is your portfolio um, if you're if you were coding before that's a great plus because in companies like ours and Boomza you have to script your own stuff. Um, worst case, that for example, you can't, there are no openings. And I actually, I want you to send your resumes to companies that you like, even if they don't post, that they're looking for a game designer. Because companies will always scoop up good talent, or they will tell you, you know, in a couple of months, again, but just get, get your work out there and keep making stuff. Worst case is you go find um, indie teams that are looking for designers even if it means you work for free, just so you have a portfolio, again, get experience. These people will know people as well. Game jams, for example, like what Gabby said, or the you know, 1YDC. Just um, because we cannot hire a person who wants to be a game designer who has not made games. It's, it's very, very difficult. But I think you won't have that problem. Let's take a question from the other side. Um, from here and all the marks, uh, do you think, for the guys who are pioneers, do you think that we can surpass our Western and Japanese counterparts in terms of game development? Yes! <laughs> so, yes, no. if, you, if you said yes, how could we do that in our local industry? What's it? Uh, 
So, ano, so there are two, ano, two facets to this question. Uh, yung answer niya is, one is yes, you are limited only by um, what limit you set for yourself. So if you feel like you can never be good as a Japanese, and you'll never be good as a Japanese. Uh, if you feel like you can never be good as the Western counterparts, then you'll never be good as those Western counterparts. That said, wishing you were as good or or you could be better doesn't mean that you will, you'll wake up tomorrow and then you'll be better. Doesn't matter if you're a one-man studio or if you're a 30-man, 100-man studio. Uh, are you trying to get better at your craft every day? Uh, are you learning more about what part of the industry you're in? Are you contributing something genuinely new uh, to this industry? These are all questions uh, that you should think about every day when you wake up. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chester didn't just get born from his mom like an art director. You know? uh, so, so, you know, there was a point in his life, very early, I'm sure, that he actually didn't know how to draw. Yeah. So, and of course, he, he had to start somewhere. And what you don't see when you look at Chester's art now are the thousands and thousands of hours that he put in trying to be as good as he is. And what separates you from your dream is that. But at the first place, you also have to have a really big dream so that you can, you can try to reach it. Yes, I was born. He was born with a bucket. Yeah, um, probably something related is that uh, uh, we've heard some news that the mobile market is probably uh, congested and some game developers are actually shifting back to PC console. Um, so I was wondering like, um, what would Alki's approach be? Uh, are you probably interested in going? or targeting Western markets for story or like we've seen a lot of indie success in the Western market and they're not really mobile related. So would I do um, I was wondering what what's Abdul approach are you going towards like are you thinking like VR at this point or something? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think um, uh, the market is very crowded now, especially in mobile. And actually, if you're a newcomer coming into Steam, Paranda, it's not that great either in terms of, you know, there's a lot of games out there, it's hard to stand out. But you know what, even if you're trying to put up a lechotman of business tomorrow, there's also a lot of existing players there and it's hard to stand out. That's just the nature of business where if you are starting a company where other people have made money, there will be like a thousand other people. But do you remember when Ragnarok was popular and then there were like 10 other game companies? Do you Andrew? you remember that time? Yeah. 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 So there were some like really, really questionable flaky uh, uh, MMOs that were in the Philippines just because Ragnarok started to make money and that changed the whole nature of the business. So, um, so how do you survive because of that? Well, number one, it's not easy. Uh, as I said, you have to have uh, some sort of differentiation. There's there's got to be a reason why they will play your match three game apart from all the other person's match three games. For example, uh, uh, you have to know the industry deeply and know your audience very well on what they like and what they don't like and what would yeah you know, what why would they want to pick up your product and play for it for a while and maybe eventually actually pay for something. So yeah, it's I would say it's just the nature of business and. Uh, whatever industry you're in, there would never be, or if there was ever a, sec a sector of, of games that would, uh, where there would not be a lot of players, and then uh, if VR started making money tomorrow, there would be a thousand developers there the next day. So I wanted to add a little bit also on this case. He mentioned uh, you mean, like some. So many developers are like returning to the PC, and since like uh, the person and my are working on uh, like, like a PC first game, uh, I wanted to share like why, you know, like why, why when it seems like the money is in is in mobile. Um, so the question you have to ask yourself is what what do you know 
And um, like, how can you use your skills, your networks, uh, to your your best advantage? So look at what your advantages are. Um, so, so, for example, for myself, like uh, the reason like I want to stick to PC is because um, I worked on a couple of uh, PC games that were uh, quite successful, like Space Cam and In Prison Architect. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so my I'm not the one that made those games, right? Like, when people say those, those games, it's not the grind, so there's not the game uh, that, that, that comes to mind. Um, but, what kind of content is there? There's a lot of content in there. I don't know, there's a lot of content in there. So, like, so that's a tiny advantage that I have, that I do not have in the mobile market. So, so why, 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 why would I target the mobile market? I don't know what I'm doing there. So, so that's one thing. Like, what are your advantages? And you know how how do you maximize uh, those advantages? And number two, what what we did was, so we hooked up with, with a publisher. I, I can't actually announce uh, who the publisher is yet, but um, but this is major major federation. So so that guy brings his own um, that guy brings his own cachet, and uh, and from, we're, we're 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 like borrowing. Like our company is basically borrowing this publisher's uh, legitness. In, uh, in, in industry, I forget what the real word is. Legitimacy. Credibility. Yeah. Thank you for showing how bad I am. And you know, it's just maybe one thing carry on with with the previous games I've worked on. There's there's a little bit of credibility, and and so that's like personally that that's what I'm banking on. Um, and you know, and then you just find like every other little advantage that you can get by like you know going to trade shows and, again like networking, shaking hands, and stuff, getting getting the word around, being on Twitter all the time. Um, and yeah, and, and, and hopefully, you know, and at the end of the day, even even if you have all of these advantages, at the end of the day, you there's still a huge chance that you fail. Um, but if you don't take those advantages into account, then you will definitely fail. You will never have a chance. So you just you have to do that. You have to give yourself every possible uh, advantage that you can, and just hope for the best. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. No, no, no. Yeah, Kevin's worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> He's been here since 9 a.m. Yeah. Right, thank you for that. Right, so I was going to ask um, if you guys have like a dream project um, that you really want to work on. Like, because you're co-founders, right? And probably when you got together, you each had that dream project that you always wanted to work on. So how's that going to how's that going to go forward with you as co-founders of Altitude? Are you going to manage to all combine your dream project into one game that you make before you finish, or you know, if you go make compromises. Do we want to make a free-to-play VR runner with movies? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, give it, yeah, yeah, sure. That's it. Like, does not involve a fun girl or a booty. So, dream games, right? Uh, one of my dream games to make is uh, a tactics-based game, like a Final Fantasy tactics, something like that. Oh, yeah. uh, but we have to take the business model in mind, the our current business model is uh, free-to-play, so how to execute that in a free-to-play uh, setting. So you say, you said compromises, and yes, there, there will be compromises. If you want to make something that <laughs> that is uncompromising, um, you better do it on your own time. Uh, because the company does not exist for you, it exists for everyone. Uh, everyone who is working in it and for its audience. So it's a lot of stuff to consider and there's a lot of responsibility there. And uh, you have to consider how important your dreams are versus the dreams of other people. Um, if you want to make your own stuff, then you got funded on your own. So, thinking about it. Um, for me, I think my approach is very different. Uh, I, I mentioned this about the angling game. No? I, I get excited working on games in general. So if you tell me, you know, okay, today Altitude really needs to work on this genre. Um, unless I really hate it, and that hasn't happened yet, I will be excited to learn. 
even if it's something I don't necessarily play. Uh, I usually play role-playing games, anything story-driven. But I also love mobile games. I love casual games. I get addicted to them. So I'm perfectly happy making the games that, that we are making. But I think what's interesting is when we started the company and there were five founders, a lot of people said, there's no way you guys can survive with five founders because you guys are going to fight. Like, how are you even going to agree on, on anything? Um, I think it worked. It was an odd number, so there's a quorum. Uh, but we've actually never really fought about anything, even just coming up with what will our first game be. And there were a ton of ideas, it was a very, very long thread. But we all agree, because I think we all are on the same page in terms of we want this to be our last job, we want uh, this to be an amazing company, providing amazing jobs for so many people. And so we always put the company first before what we personally would like. Um, yeah. But Paul's not here, so maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's unhappy. He actually disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. <laughs> That's why. Uh, I agree with what, what Chester said about compromise. Um, my dream project would be maybe a uh, Final Fantasy JRPG. What? Hey, yeah. These days, I I don't have the patience to play. Long, long games. Uh, I, I want sessions that have one game sessions. I'm old. Yeah, so the funny thing is I've always wanted to make games, but it's involved in such that there is no one, I guess, dream game that I would like to make. Around at this point, uh, it's actually my dream that I get to wake up and work with these people. And Paul also is not here. Yeah, every single day for the rest of my career. That's that's my dream.